Hey, church leaders, welcome to the Slingshot Group podcast. I'm your host, Tim Foote, CEO of Slingshot Group, where we build remarkable teams and healthy culture through staffing and coaching. And for today's conversation, I'm joined by Mike Foster. He's a best selling author, speaker, executive coach, and he's all about empowering people to build strong lives and healthy leadership by turning their setbacks into superpowers. I think it was Thomas Akempis who said, a humble self-knowledge is a surer pathway to God than a quest for learning or something like that. And this conversation is all about self-awareness, which we believe is the number one value in healthy leadership. This conversation is profound and I can't wait for you to hear it. So let's jump in. Welcome, Mike. It is so great to have you with us today. You're a man of many talents with a fascinating background. You're an author, speaker, executive coach, and I know you also happen to be a close friend of Stan Ennicott, our Slingshot co-founder. You wrote the foreword in his book, Improv Leadership. Uh, Give us a quick snapshot of your journey. When I talk about my journey, Stan Ennicott, for sure, greatly shaped uh, who I am today and where I am today. Mm. I owe that man uh, so much. But my uh, my story is really just the story of really just wanting to help people and yeah. helping people get clear about their lives and really understand their gifts and their strengths. And I think so often what stands in the way of that, Tim, is our pain and our trauma and some of our insecurities. And so really kind of blending both this idea of um, helping people get clear on what's going on in terms of our lives and maybe some of the hidden things that are driving our lives. Right. And then taking action and really kind of living into the fullness of everything that God created us to be. And so that's been my work like for 20 plus years. And um, in a practical sense, it plays out Monday through Friday. I'm working with leaders every single day um, as an executive coach. Um, I work with organizations and companies around mental health and wellness, uh, helping them you know, create positive company culture. I do workshops here at my house uh, called The Strongest Workshop, where it's kind of a two-day intensive. And so lots of different expressions of it. But fundamentally, my, my goal is just to help people uh, live full and thriving lives. Mm. You're described as an experiential specialist, Mike. What mm-hmm. does that actually mean? Yeah, for me, like most of my work is not so much about talk therapy and mm. talking about things, but really creating experiences. Um, a lot of my training is in psychodrama and experiential therapy, where we get the body moving, we get uh, people drawing, we have people having experiences, because fundamentally, I believe that's the best way to create transformational change. Talking's good, but I think in many ways, it engages too much of our head um, versus our body, which I think is such a powerful tool for us having the breakthroughs that we're looking for. And so very much want to get people moving, getting them activated getting them in motion, getting them creatively thinking about uh, the issues versus just talking about them. And Mike, I have seen the breakthrough and life change as a result of your work. And so thank Mm. you for for what you've dedicated your life and career to. You are known often as the Mr. Rogers of personal development. Mike, I wish I could be known known as Mr. Rogers of anything, Uh, but that's fantastic. (laughs) Tell us what sparked this passion on personal development and helping people reach their fullest potential. Yeah, I think, Tim, like most things, uh, the work that we do today, whatever our work is, is very much informed by the very problem we're trying to solve in our own lives. Mm. And so for me, I I have had a lot of um, setbacks, a lot of trauma, a lot of um, just issues where where I think my story could have broke and Mm. I could have broke. Mm. But through, you know, a lot of a lot of personal work, a lot of people helping, coming alongside, challenging me, helping, uh, helping me. And I, you know, I I'm very honest about my story. I, I do two hours of therapy every month. I am in a 12-step 
uh, group. I do these things because of the things that were supposed to break me didn't break me. And I realized that in order to like live my strongest, fullest life, I got to be working, working on the kind of core things that want to derail Mike Foster. And so, Mm -hmm. um, and I don't look at that as sort of like, there's something wrong with me. I think it's just a strategic decision that I make every day that, you know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of um, opportunities here in our pain. I think there's a lot of risks in our pain. Mm. And so just managing that well as an individual, and that's fundamentally what my work is. I, I believe our setbacks become our superpowers. I believe that pain drives great purpose in our lives. And so how I got here was through uh, a lot of pain, a lot of trauma, but then doing the work and really uh, experiencing the benefit of that. Mike, I know that you're a remarkable leadership executive coach and you coach uh, some very successful, and I know there's all kinds of definitions to that word, leaders that we all mm. would know. I also know that, that the word coach can often be code word and from personal experience can often be code word for therapist. Uh, <laughs> so for the church leaders listening to this today, buckle up because this conversation could lead to breakthrough for you personally and change and mm. shape how you build and lead your team. Mike, you've just released a brilliant book called The Seven Primal Questions. Uh, take control of the hidden forces that drive you. In that book, you said you've spent you've spent six thousand hours interviewing people, 22 group mm-hmm. labs, all about their primal question and how it impacts their life. We'll dive into these questions here in a minute, but first give us some context about the book and what you're hoping this does uh, for leaders, teams, marriages. W- what, what are you hoping for this? Yeah, I think for me, the um, so number one, I'm really glad it's out because it was a lot of hours, 6,000 hours of interviews, yes. four, four years of research. Uh, I did 22 group labs with people. So there's been like, this isn't just a book where like, I've got an idea, let's just kind of throw it out into the world. It It's fundamentally the way I, the framework for how I do all my coaching, how I do all my interactions, all my leadership development. It is the fundamental framework. And it, it basically looks like this, Tim. We are imprinted in our early childhood with a question, mm. a question that went unanswered, a question that perhaps was planted through trauma or just confusion, okay? Mm. Um, And we carry this question into our adult lives and we subconsciously ask it. And when the answer to that primal question is a yes, our life is good, we're grounded, Mm. we're our best versions of ourselves. But when the answer to that primal question is a no or a maybe, we go into what I call the scramble. And the scramble is all the unhelpful things that we do in our lives, people pleasing, performance addiction, uh, codependency, you know, control, all of these things that we do in the scramble are all the activities where we use those activities to force the answer to our primal question back to a yes. And it's a very simple idea. It's a very simple construct, but it has powerful implications with our choices with our emotions, our leadership. Um, I'll give you an example. I was with a group from Chick-fil-A a couple of weeks ago, and we were talking about how the primal question impacts the organization of Chick-fil-A. And we looked at Truett Cathy, who is the founder of the company, and we looked at some of the choices that he made. And in so much of what Chick-fil-A is today, in terms of their values, their franchise model, their um, their their no debt philosophy; those types of things were shaped by certainly by Truett's leadership, but fundamentally, what I would say and what we talked about is that all of that was shaped fundamentally by something more profound and deeper within Truett, his primal question. Hmm. And so, once we and here's the beautiful thing about this, Tim, is once we understand the question that we're asking. We can actually take control of it and understand its influence in our lives, in our marriages, in our the vision that we cast for our churches or for our organizations. 
We understand why certain things are important to us and why certain things are not. All of a sudden, it's just like the light, a 50,000 watt light bulb comes on on the our inner programming. And it's like, oh, wow, this is just going to get really exciting now and um, really clear. And we become more effective that way. To me, it's like, I don't want to live in my scramble. I don't want to be doing things that are going to undermine my life or my leadership. And the only way that I can avoid that is I need to know what the question is that I'm trying to have answered by my wife, by my, my coworkers, by uh, society at large, by God, by even God himself. This is really profound, Mike. And I know you know it because you did 6,000 hours and 22 <laughs> labs and all of that. What I love about this for the listeners is there's so much to it and you absolutely have to read the book, but you have also simplified the process. You've given us the questions and then you've talked about how that affects us and the effect of the scramble. So let's jump straight in and give us, give us a list of what these seven primal questions are and a brief overview. Yeah, so they, there's a specific order and there's lots of layers to this. And we're just going to kind of touch the, the tip of the iceberg on this. But I'll, I'm going to give you the seven questions and some of the ramifications of each question. So number one, the first question is the question, am I safe? And that's, that's my primal question. And so the person that, and I got imprinted with that question because of my early childhood experiences of abuse, okay, mm. and didn't feel protected. And so now I carry this question in my adulthood. I keep asking the question, am I safe? When somebody answers that question, yes, I feel good. But when they answer it, no, or a maybe, I go into the scramble. And my mm -hmm. scramble doesn't look good, Tim. It's, mm -hmm. it's not the way I want to live, feeling unsafe or out of control or unprotected. But one of the beautiful things that happens with each of the primal questions, and I'll, I'll, I'll unpack this with each one, is that there's also what I call the primal gift, and I talk about this in the book, is where we take our primal question and we place it over everybody else in the world. And so what I do with my am I safe question is I assume, Tim, you're asking the exact same question. And what I do unconsciously, not, not in a like strategic or manipulative way, I try to answer yes to the question, am I safe for you? Mm. So this becomes a relational superpower that I have because of my primal question. Because basically I've been studying safety since early childhood. Right. I am an expert. I have a PhD on safety because mm -hmm. it's my highest emotional need that I need. So I assume, Tim, you have that exact same need. And so this is how I use it in my, my leadership or in my life. People tell me their deepest, darkest secrets after knowing me for five minutes. Why do they do that? Well, they do that because they feel safe with me. And I, I'm not doing this like as a uh, something I learned in college or some tactic. It's just something that has been important to me. So I, I want to make it important to you. And so people tell me things very easily and they feel protected when they're in my presence. I also use it a lot in conflict resolution because I have the supernatural gift of safety I get brought into when there's a lot of conflict, whether it's a marriage, a couple who's in conflict, team members who are in conflict. I'm the guy you want coming into that space to have protected, safe conversations to get to solutions. So with every question, every primal question comes this really beautiful gift that we can deploy. So question number two, am I secure? Now, a lot of people ask, what's the difference between security and safety? Well, security is around financial resource. Do I have enough financial resources to survive and protect myself? So I have a client, I wrote about this in the book, flies in on his $30 million jet into the private airport here near my house. And his question is, am I secure? And he wonders if he has enough financial resources to survive and protect himself. And this is this is where it's really important to, to note that math, math is no match for emotions. This is why we've got to understand the emotional power of this programming in our lives, because this guy's worth probably $500 million flying around in a $30 million jet. I saw the jet, Tim, it's a very nice jet. Okay. But he still is driven by the question of wondering whether he has enough. And so he works 70 hour weeks. He's flying all around the country all the time. His wife would like him home a bit more, but he's caught 
trying to answer this question with a with a yes all the time. Instead, what I talk about in the book is the solution to the question living in our question. Am I safe? Am I safe? Am I secure? Am I secure? The scramble of that. We live in what I call the primal truth, where we take our question and turn it into a statement. So for this client that I'm working with, he no longer needs to a- ask the question, am I secure? He needs to turn it into a statement, I am secure, and then make the choices for your life. Same for me. I need to live in the primal truth, I am safe, and then make the choices for my life. Not live in this place where I'm not sure. I don't allow the society or the world to answer my safety question. I literally answer it for myself. I also allow God to answer that question, Tim, and know that I am safe and protected. Because fundamentally, all these questions are are kid questions. They're from our childhood. They're they're very simple questions. I just want to know if I'm safe. I wasn't sure when I was a kid, but I don't have to. I'm now 6'4", 200 pounds. I can protect myself. I live in a very nice suburb of San Diego. It's not dangerous here, Tim. Right. But if I live my life wondering if I'm safe, that's going to compromise a lot of decisions and opportunities that I might have. So again, the awareness of the question and its power. Mm-hmm. So am I safe? Am I secure? Question three is, am I loved? This is really the idea where to be seen and known and listened to and heard. This is this is the highest emotional need of this person. By the way, with each question comes what I call the kryptonite of each question, the thing that will immediately send you into your scramble. So for this person who has the question, am I loved? Their kryptonite is indifference. So when somebody's just kind of like, yeah, I can take her to leave it. Yeah, maybe, you know, you're okay. That sort of attitude that will send you into your scramble. And all of a sudden you go to people pleasing and over giving and over responsibility, like all these things to try to get people to love you. And so being aware of your kryptonite is a really important part of this too. Um, question four, am I wanted? This is the need to feel included and a part of the need to feel pursued. Typically, these are kids who felt perhaps like an outsider in their family or rejected by mom and dad. The research shows that a lot of people who have been adopted or in foster care carry this question now as adults. My friend Bob Goff, his primal question is, am I wanted? And I love, I love Bob because you can see both his primal question, but you also see his primal gift. There's no other person in this world that I know who is more inclusive than Bob Goff, right? Because he's taking his primal question of am I wanted and putting it over everybody else. But he's the only person that I know who put his cell phone number in the back of his book that has sold 3 million copies. Why do you think Bob put his phone number in the back of his book? Because every single time he gets a phone call from somebody, Tim, he knows he's wanted. Mm. It's a yes to his primal question. So again, for Bob to understand that hidden programming, to understand why why he's so gifted in, in inclusion, why does he write about? Why does he write books called Love Does and Everybody Always? Why is he always pursuing the outsider? It's because of the imprint of the primal question. Question five: Am I successful? These are people who typically grew up in competitive homes. This is about winning. Life is about winning. It's about keeping score. And so the kryptonite for question five folks is failure. They'll do anything in their power to make sure that they don't fail. So think about this as a leader. How would I use somebody in my organization who has a question five? Well, if I got a really important project that I'm trying to launch here, I definitely want a question five on top of that, okay? I want a question five leading that. You don't want me, the am I safe guy leading that because I'm gonna be looking at all the, all the ways this could go wrong. But the five is gonna be so about like finding success because that's his primal gift. Question six, am I good enough? This is really about value. A lot of people who have this question grew up in homes where you know there was a lot of criticism, a lot of judgment. I find that, you kind of joke, every Disney star, kid star mm. has this question, am I good enough? Wow. Right? Right, right. <laughs> if you grew up in Hollywood or on TV, constant criticism, all, you know, super competitive, like all this stuff, you're going to never, you're going to be like imprinted with this question um, of am I good enough? And so I had to share a story in the book about 
a, a CEO trying to give a CFO feedback. And the CFO had the question six of, am I good enough? And anytime the CEO came to the, his CFO to talk about the numbers, the walls would go up, the defensiveness went up. And so I coached the, the CEO and said, hey, listen, here's what's going on. You have to be very, very strategic about how to give feedback to a question six, because as you're giving this feedback, it feels like criticism and it feels like a no or a maybe to their primal question of, am I good enough? Again, in organizations, we want to be aware of how to engage with people around their primal question, because here's the thing, the CEO is not criticizing the CFO's performance. He was just wanting to talk about the numbers. And so if we could find new strategies of connecting, communicating based on our primal question, we're gonna create effectiveness and efficiency in that communication. And then finally, question seven is, do I have purpose? What's really great about this question, Tim, is these are the people that want impact, significance, legacy. They're the world changers. They're the vision casters. Again, they're using their primal gift in a really powerful way. But they're, where they get tripped up is a lot of times they feel like they are not doing enough to change mm -hmm. the world. Is God going to be happy with me? You know, like maybe they're just working a, a corporate job and they feel like this compulsion that they should be digging wells in Africa because that's really significant work versus providing for your family and um, doing a, a corporate gig. And so they get a lot caught up in this angst, this mm -hmm. purpose angst. And what's what's interesting too about this question is a lot of times people who grew up in religious homes tend to carry this question because mom and dad were always talking about doing something great for God. Mike, this is so insightful. And this is how you know, I'm a pathological question asker and I didn't interrupt you once when you were saying those <laughs> questions because I'm doing a self-analysis here. Right. I mean, we have... We have learned in all our work building teams that the, the number one value in healthy leadership is self-awareness. And I can so see how these questions build into that and, and correlate with your superpower. So my big question is, what's the best way to find out your primal question? Is there an assessment? Is it a self-assessment? How does this work? Yes. So if you go to my website, mikefoster.tv, there's a free assessment. It takes less than five minutes and it will produce two options as possible primal questions for you. Now, one of the things that I love about this is that you don't actually need an online assessment, but in a matter of minutes, and the, this is what I love about the simplicity of the primal question, is a leader with a 10-minute conversation with an employee or a 10-minute conversation, you know, if you're in a marriage, let me tell you, Tim, this tool has fundamentally changed my marriage because wow. we're talking about the right things now. What I need from my wife and my spouse is to yeah. answer my primal question with a yes. And I need to answer her primal question with a yes. And so often relationships fundamentally don't work and mm. they fail because we're unintentionally answering that person's primal question with a no or a maybe. And fundamentally, it won't survive if you keep doing that. Oh, I, I can see how it would color the way that you would communicate knowing the primal question of your spouse, knowing the primal question of the people people you lead or you lead with. Uh, it, it's it's fascinating when I think about the situations that we work with and in to help churches and leaders navigate ministry, navigate team dynamics. So often these can be pointed back to unmet needs when a primal mm -hmm. question is being answered with a no. And, and if a leader's primal question of I am successful, for example, is being answered with a no or a maybe, the scramble happens, which can get messy. And we encounter, Mike, no surprise to you, lots of mess in our work. I mean, we've got mm -hmm. people that are doing ministry together. Can some of the unhealthy situations we're seeing be rooted in the answer to, to leader's primal question being a no and then the scramble happens? Talk about that. And is there a common question that you're seeing in churches and leadership around the country that's causing some of these meltdowns yes the the implications on leadership and i basically tim you know i just released the seven primal questions which is the set up the concept my next book will be a leadership book how this tool impacts organizations and leadership and teams is that releasing next week mike we need that next <laughs> yes week. i know i just i set it up in the this the new book just that i kind of wet the appetite but uh it will probably uh, be a little bit longer than next week uh, for its release date. But this is what I get excited about because 
when a leader is released into health and wholeness, mm. Mm. when a leader understands their core needs, man, organizations win, teams win, churches win. This is what unlocks incredible impact in an organization when a leader is healthy that way. But so often we are blind to the programming inside of us. We dismiss it. We minimize it. See, Tim, a lot of leaders will go, it's not okay for me to actually have a need. Okay. It's not okay for me to actually have a primal question. I, I was talking to a CEO today and one of his needs, because he's a question six, am I good enough? Mm-hmm. One of his core needs is affirmation and encouragement. But as his, as a CEO, he's never going to get affirmation and encouragement. He's responsible for affirming and encouraging those on the org chart below him. Mm-hmm. It rarely flows up into the CEO, right? The CEO is not getting necessarily thank you notes all the time, but the CEO is always writing thank you notes, hopefully to their team members. I told him, I said, listen, you have got to clue your team into this need that you have. You can't just fundamentally ignore the fact that you need affirmation and encouragement from the people that you work with. And let's just own it, right? Let's just own the fact that we have this need, realize it, ask for it from, from people who can help meet that need. But then also as leaders, we take responsibility for meeting our own needs too. And that's the primal truth. Like I got to remind myself that I'm safe, that I don't Mm. have to like perform or do anything or, you know, have some financial success or whatever the things that make me feel safe. I am safe. And so the more that we live in the truth of our lives and who we are, I find a lot of pastors, a lot of pastors are, am I wanted people and am Mm. I loved people, which Mm. makes no, that's, that's not a big surprise, right? To draw crowds to be loved mm. and admired, to be listened to on a Sunday morning. That, do, that doesn't surprise us. But if we are unaware of that kind of core wow. driver, that yes. could get us into really some big trouble. Yeah. It's interesting too, that explains why those that are in the lead seat in a church, things can become so personal when somebody leaves the church yes, or there when, when there's criticism and that's going to happen all the time. It's an, it's the nature of ministry and understanding what that question is. So you, so speak to that for a minute, Mike, you understand what the question is. Like, is mm-hmm. it I'm needed, I'm wanted. You get, uh, you get some really tough criticism or, or, a, or a, a faction of the, of, of the congregation leaves. How do you handle the, the fact that that's going to cause a scramble? What, what, how do you counteract a scramble? We're never going to fully sort of prevent ourselves from going into a scramble. The key is to spend less time in the scramble, to know when we're in the scramble and why we're in the scramble. And then I encourage leaders and and individuals to say, what are the resources that I need to put around myself to help draw me out of the scramble? So for example, maybe you have had some people leave your church and you're an am I wanted question for, that's your your primal question. Okay, that rejection is certainly going to kind of shake your snow globe and and bring you into the scramble. So what do we need to do, Tim? Well, first of all, we got to coach ourselves to say, okay, this is one family out of a hundred families. Okay. Mm-hmm. Bring ourselves back into truth. Okay. This is one family, not everybody's rejecting me. Or perhaps when we think about rejection, we need to have a healthier dialogue around what rejection actually is. Perhaps their rejection of you is actually not a rejection of you at all. It's this, them having it being in a different life stage, being, having a different need. Or their question not being answered. Their, their question not being answered. Exactly. So oftentimes we personalize everything, right? And that's easy to do, but healthy leadership, self-leadership, primal truth living says, I have a really um, sober understanding and mindset about what these things are that are actually sending me into my scramble. Again, for me, it's like, I'm safe. If your qu- primal question is, am I wanted? You know, you're wanted. Let's not play a game here. Mm-hmm. Let's not, let's not allow like one person leaving our church to now completely annihilate our wantedness. It's just, it's just a poor way to live. Could you boil down uh, some of the meltdowns, dysfunction, actually toxicity that we're seeing uh, in churches around the country uh, being rooted in the answer to the leader's primal question being a a no? Would you simplify it down to that? I I would. I, I think everything just 
again, I hope the tool is so simple that fundamentally everything attaches both good and bad, our best choices and our worst choices yeah. are attached to this one question. We can like do all the stuff, right? But if we're not living in this place of I am safe, I am secure, I am loved, I am wanted, I am successful, I am good enough, I do have purpose. If we're not fundamentally living that that space and reminding ourselves daily of that truth, we're gonna we're gonna struggle. Like here here's one thing with the "Am I loved?" question. I found that many people who are vulnerable to affairs have the "Am I loved?" question because that is so such a powerful elixir in our lives to be loved. That when someone comes to us and answers our primal question with a yes. Yes, yes, like you are loved. That can oftentimes create a vulnerability for us, right? Mm. Because we're needing somebody else to answer our primal question with a yes versus we're answering it for ourselves. I already know I'm loved, so I don't need this, uh, I don't need this affair. That awareness is so, so powerful, Mike. And this is a really great follow-up to a, a podcast we did in season one, episode four with Steve Cuss managing mm. leadership anxiety, yours and yes. theirs, and how everybody shows up with their brand of anxiety. You're drilling down deeper and saying, everybody's got a question. How powerful, if you're leading a team, uh, maybe you're at a smaller church with a group of, of elders that you're leading, for, for all of you to do this assessment, read this book, and understand what is driving your superpower, but what also is causing the shadow side when the answers are no and you go into a scramble. So here's, here's an interesting uh, tangent. We work a lot in, uh, in succession coaching. So we mm. come into churches a year or two before there's going to be a senior leadership change. Uh, what happens to a church and a team when there's a leadership change and the question changes. Well, interesting that you bring that up because the work that I was doing with Chick-fil-A a couple of weeks ago, we were talking about the shift in company culture and vision. So we went from Truett, who had Am I Secure as his primal question, influencing so much of the start of Chick-fil-A. And then we have we had Dan, Kathy, who uh, in kind of the workshopping that we did identified his primal question of am I successful? So Dan Dan took what Truett started and just threw, you know, gasoline on that fire and blew up Chick-fil-A to what it is today. And then we now have, uh, they just had another uh, shift and uh, a new CEO, Dan's uh, stepping down. And we were discussing what is Andrew's primal question. And one of the things that, again, I don't like to sort of put primal questions on people. Right, I want them right. to assess it. And I want more of a dialogue, but this is more of just kind of a concept they were working with. We, the, the thought was Andrew's primal question was probably, uh, do I have purpose? So I look at that transition that's happening right now. My guess is where Dan blew something up big and became mm. very, very successful. They won. Chick-fil-A mm. won, all right, mm. which is what a am I successful person would do. But I could see Chick-fil-A with Andrew's leadership moving much more towards legacy, significance, mm impact other initiatives that Chick-fil-A is getting involved in that would be more around purpose versus success. And how do you think a team adjusts? Well, the team, here's the thing that the team needs to be understanding is the influence of the leader's primal question will influence the priorities of the company. And so it is going to look different. And you can't go, well, I want Truett's vision. I want Dan's vision. It's not the way it's going to work. Now, a lot of those, those the DNA of Chick-fil-A is still going to be there, right? But if you're wondering why certain leadership decisions are made, being made around a greater focus on purpose, you can look to your CEO's primal question. Mike, I know we're, there's, there's so many personality profiles. This is a different spin on that, a, a deeper look at, okay, what drives us? 
uh, how do we communicate with each other, how we're more self-aware when we're in the scramble. I know, uh, especially with the Enneagram, uh, some are all about the assessment, some are about self-assessment. Talk real quick about if we take the the assessment, which I'm sure a lot of leaders are going to do when they're done listening to this podcast, yes. we don't agree with the two questions or the or the question that comes up speak to that for a moment how much does self-assessment play into this the the book goes into this in greater detail about how to just self-assess and to be real honest him i love self-assessment i like facilitated one-on-one with people working through this because there's a lot more nuance and details but the the online assessment at my website, mikefoster.tv, is a great place to start but in terms of self-assessment a couple things i'd be looking at key areas Number one, I'd look at your triggers. What triggers you? What gets you emotionally activated? Basically, what sends you into your scramble? What are the things that are happening around you? Is it about disrespect? Is it about rejection? Really, the kryptonite that's attached Mm -hmm. to each of the questions would guide us towards the question. The second thing I would look at would be, what is your relational superpower? What is the thing that you do really well with people? Again, this is you taking your primal question, putting it over somebody else and wanting to answer yes. So like, are you a really loving person, a really empathetic person? Well, that might be question three, am I loved? Are you really a great coach and leader and you want to make people successful? And, and, and that might be question Question five, am I successful? Mm. Are you are a vision caster with people? Are you want people to live their best lives and have a great impact in the world? Well, that might be, do I have purpose? Question seven. And so looking at your relational superpower, but also looking at your message, your message to mm. the world. Like my message to the world is, I want you to know, Tim, you're safe, you're protected, mm. you're going to be okay. That's informed by my primal question. So think about what is the one thing that I would want to say to somebody right now? I w- this would desperately want them to know that they're loved, that they're wanted, they're uh, successful, that they're good enough, that they have a purpose, that message will point to your primal question. And then the final thing that I would look at in terms of self-assessment is your family of origin. What was going on in your home that perhaps was unclear or traumatic where you would have a question, you know, did, was there something going on in your home where you just didn't fundamentally feel safe? Were mom and dad talking about bills on the, all the time and not having enough money? And Did Christmas get a little bit smaller one year and create some confusion for you as a kid to know whether you had enough money to survive? So that could be question two, am I secure? So just looking again at our family of origin environments and see what messaging may have got the wires crossed a bit. And again, I go into this in the book and I give lots of different examples and practical ways this plays out, but that's, those would be the areas of self-assessment. Be looking at those areas and they're all going to be pointing to your primal question. Mate, do you know how hard it is to do a podcast when you are doing so much introspection and self-analysis? Like I'm thinking through my marriage right now. I'm thinking through the team that I lead. I'm, I'm, I'm thinking through all of this real time as you're talking, as I'm sure leaders are. So um, as we get ready to close out, talk to leaders today who are trying so hard to lead their teams well. How can they use these questions to be a more effective leader for their teams? Yeah. Well, two things I would say. Number one is a team member will not fully buy into a leader's vision or goal or what they want to do in the organization or in the company. They will not fully buy in until that leader first answers yes to that person's primal question. Wow. That's huge. So... This is why this is the implications only. I want to know my employee's primal question so I can orient around that because fundamentally, here's what happens is there's this resistance and this side management that I'm going to have with you if you're my leader, Tim. If I'm not quite feeling safe with you or feeling protected with you, I'm going to be over here kind of managing that versus if you were answering my primal question with a yes, I'd be all in with you. I would not be managing this this question anymore with you. I could go all in. I knew that you'd had my back. I knew that I was protected. I knew that I was safe. I knew that you're a straight, a straight shooter and telling me the truth. I could go all in. But if I didn't feel that way with you, I felt like, yeah, maybe Tim's giving me a maybe to my primal question. All of this inefficiency, and I'm going to still work on protecting myself with you. We don't want that as leaders. 
Absolutely. That is so helpful. And and I've got like about 50 more questions that would take us another hour, which means I need to come to San Diego and sit opposite that pottery barn chair. Please. And borrow one of your Mr. Rogers cardigans. I love a good cardigan. <laughs> and feel safe. I would feel safe, wouldn't I, Mike? You'd make sure I did. But Absolutely. Just so- so many, so many questions and just the, 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 the concept of the kryptonite and then the superpower, just really, really helpful. Uh, remind us one more time, Mike, because I know that leaders are going to jump off, take the assessment, get the book, read this and apply this. How can people follow along with you and engage in the work that you're doing? Yeah. So um, again, my website, mikefoster.tv, you can get the assessment there, free assessment and you can buy the book there. The book's also on Amazon. Um, you can get an Amazon and then, uh, I would say, you know, Instagram, I'm, I'm pretty active on Instagram. I, I love interacting with people on that. And that's just at Mike Foster 2000, because there's 1,999 other Mike Fosters, but I'm Mike Foster 2000 on Instagram. And that's a great way to interact. And Tim, it, you know, come come to one of the workshops. Come mm. hang out. I mean, I really my goal here is to equip leaders with the concept so that they can go back into their organizations and their families and their teams and deploy the concept into their environments because you know, there's only one of me and there yeah. I I you know, I like to have weekends and uh mm. Um, so, but like equipping leaders, and this is what you guys are so great at doing is just helping, helping leaders be the best versions of themselves, mm-hmm. helping teams be the best versions of the, th- that the team can be healthy organizations. And so like, I'm a big believer in just like get equipped and then go spread it and share it. Mike, so grateful for the work that you've done, the work that you do and the gift this book is to the, to the world, to leadership to ministry and can't wait to see the impact that it's going to have. Uh, So have enjoyed this conversation today. Thank you for being with us. Thanks, Tim. It's been awesome being with you today. Thanks for listening today. I got to tell you, that conversation was a gift to me personally. I hope it was to you. Maybe you're listening alone. I would encourage you to send this to friends, uh, to people on your team, so they can become aware of what their question is. Maybe you're in the middle of a scramble right now, and it might not be your own, but it might be somebody who you work with, somebody who you live with, and you need to work out what their question is. They need to work out what their question is. It might be time to jump off and take that questionnaire. If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe, leave a review on Apple Podcast, or share it with another leader. Thanks again. And until next time, stay curious and reach for the remarkable.